Hi everybody, Old Gobbler Neck is back again for another weekly research roundup. Russ Barkley here, thanks for joining me. And we're reviewing research that was published during the week of July the 7th. The first article I want to point out is a very nice and extensive review of the literature on what appears to be a controversial topic among subscribers to this channel, uh, and that is on the relationship of early childhood adverse events, often referred to as childhood trauma, and the link with ADHD. This research was published in the journal Mental Health Services, and it shows uh, I, once again, that there is, in fact, a correlation between these events, uh, between adverse experiences and ADHD and vice, vice versa. So uh, let's have a, a quick look at this study. I don't want to go into an awful lot of detail because there are already three videos on my channel dealing with this topic. But this new review looked at 43 studies, as you see here, that met all of their inclusion criteria to even be reviewed. There's a lot of other studies out there and papers. There are case reports. There are studies that were poorly done. Uh, they didn't look for confounding factors in the relationship and so on. So this review selected what it considered to be the best of the research studies and then goes on to review the this relationship. So A, what did it find? There is a relationship between ADHD and adverse childhood experiences. The higher your symptoms of ADHD, the more likely you have experienced adverse childhood events and the more such events you would have experienced. Vice versa, people who experience more adverse events are more likely to have ADHD as well. So that's kind of where things stand. Now, in this review, they do talk about the few studies that found that the exposure to adverse events was to some extent related to the parents having ADHD, the genetic relationship between the parents and the child, uh, and that it really had to do with the environment that ADHD families were creating that pose greater risk for these children to experience adverse events. Other studies also pointed out that ADHD children, by virtue of their disorder, are more likely to put themselves in harm's way and experience adverse events, pretty much through their impulsivity, their risk-taking, and as we've already talked about elsewhere on this channel, all of that increasing risk for a child experiencing accidental injuries and other traumatic events. Um, so I think it's fairly clear that ADHD can increase risk for childhood adverse events. It's a lot less clear that adverse events lead to, in a causal way, ADHD. And the authors of this paper say the same thing. In the conclusion at the end of this paper, they point out that there's no way to establish a causal relationship at the moment between adverse events and later ADHD and vice versa. So it remains a correlation in need of further investigation. But also, as I pointed out, and which the authors did not, unfortunately, these studies need to be genetically informed, controlling for the extent of ADHD risk genes in the parent controlling for the extent of ADHD symptoms in the parent and then in the child as well, so that we can then determine how much these adverse events really are contributing to later ADHD or how much is ADHD contributing to experiencing adverse events. So have a look at the review. It's otherwise a very thorough review, despite its absence of discussion of the genetics here, um, but a good review nonetheless. Now, the second paper I want to take a look at uh, moves over into the neurology of ADHD. ADHD, as you know, has already been well established as arising from various neurological difficulties within the brain. We've known this for over 30 years. There has been evidence of smaller cortical matter, smaller subcortical matter, smaller regions of the brain, such as the prefrontal cortex, and connections back into the brain as well. And then more recently, studies showing that there are problems with how these regions connect up with each other. And so here is yet one other study showing that these regions of the brain that we know have been linked to ADHD previously 
show low functional connectivity. That is, they're not talking to each other the way they should. As one activates, the other should be activating, and it isn't. So there is reduced connectivity and reduced functional brain connectivity uh, in people with ADHD. And specifically, this study shows that it is especially related to the degree of inhibition or impulsivity in children. Uh, so a very good paper, but one among hundreds showing the neurological basis of ADHD, but interesting in the sense that this illustrates the problem with functional connectivity. Uh, now we're going to move on to a really nice review that was published uh, on the relationship between ADHD and the extent of cannabis use in patients with the condition. We've known going back for decades that childhood ADHD and adolescent ADHD predispose people to a higher risk of cannabis use and abuse. We also know that it predisposes them to alcohol use and abuse as well. Uh, so it really is alcohol, marijuana, and thirdly, tobacco that ADHD predisposes to. As far as risk for abusing other drugs, we see that only in the subset of people with ADHD who have gone on into antisocial behavior, conduct disorder, uh, and so on. So that subset of people, which is about 25 to 40 percent of people with ADHD roughly, is the one at risk for other hard drug use and abuse. But ADHD alone, even in the absence of those other problems with antisocial behavior, had previously been shown in many longitudinal studies to increase risk for alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco use. This review focuses on cannabis use. And after reviewing 136 studies to see how rigorous they were, they found 20 articles that met their screening criteria for review. So there's a lot of articles out there, but not all of them are very well done. Uh, and this review looks at the best of the best, so to speak. Uh, and it goes through in detail and discusses uh, these relationships and factors that mediate the relationship between ADHD and cannabis use. We don't have time to go into all of the details uh, to get into the weeds here, as people say. But there is a chart further down in the review that kind of summarizes what all of these studies are saying. So excuse me for scrolling so quickly. I hope you took your Dramamine. Uh, but here's what this chart shows. Here are ADHD symptoms and signs. Here are cannabis use symptoms and signs. We're not going to deal with that necessarily, um, other than to point out that there is ample evidence to show that cannabis use increases problems with inattention, increases problems with verbal uh, working memory, and also decreases blood flow to certain parts of the brain. So here's what the review found the effects of cannabis on ADHD patients. First of all, it found there was some neurological effects, some narrowing of brain activity within uh, people who were using cannabis and who had ADHD. It also found that there was increased activation in the right hippocampus and back in the cerebellum in the central area known as the vermis. So there are neurological effects of cannabis use being demonstrated here. I, I think most people are aware that cannabis can have effects on brain, of course, because it is a psychoactive substance. Interestingly, this review found that there was decreased dopamine transporter availability in the brain. Why is that important? Because the drugs we use to treat ADHD activate dopamine, particularly through the transporter. Uh, and we know that ADHD is related to lower levels of availability of dopamine to some extent. Uh, and that's why dopamine agonists, that is drugs that increase dopamine, are so useful in managing ADHD. And this appears to be suggesting that cannabis use uh, is actually lowering dopamine use even further in the brain. Uh, and that may not be a very good thing. So something to, to think about. 37% of the people who had cannabis use disorder also were found to have ADHD as a comorbidity. That's about seven times higher than the rate of ADHD in the general population. So we're seeing kind of a two-way street here. ADHD increases risk for comorbid cannabis use. Studying people who have cannabis use disorder shows us they have a high rate 
of ADHD as well. So it cuts both ways here. The studies also found that higher ADHD symptoms, particularly in students, led to a greater continuous usage of cannabis at currently and later in life, but there were some limitations to those studies uh, that the authors point out here. This is very intriguing. ADHD is causally related to cannabis use over time. So if you have ADHD, you are nearly eight times more likely to be using and abusing cannabis than are people without ADHD. Other studies show that teenagers with more severe ADHD had earlier initiation of marijuana use. So severity of ADHD pertains to when you start uh, and how early you start. This paper or several studies in this review found that the higher use of medical cannabis doses led to a decrease in ADHD medication consumption. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe using cannabis to treat your ADHD re results in you're not needing as much medication. But be careful here. It could go the other way around. Relying more on marijuana to help you with your ADHD could be interfering with your medication adherence that is use of medication for therapeutic purposes. So it may not be a good thing. It could be keeping you from relying on your medication to help manage your disorder. The, some papers also found that the online forums that advocate for using cannabis to treat ADHD um, could be increasing people turning to cannabis use and making this situation worse. Uh, and that's because right now there's no definitive evidence that cannabis benefits people with ADHD. There's a lot of talk, there's a lot of anecdote and opinion, but there's no good controlled studies that I'm aware of that show that cannabis helps to manage the symptoms of ADHD. So we need a lot more research on that issue. And then finally, cannabis usage in those with ADHD in adulthood did cause an increase in later inpatient admissions to the hospital and more prolonged admissions in the hospital uh, than people with ADHD who weren't using cannabis. So uh, again, a very nice review of the research that's out there. Hope you'll take a look at it. Uh, this is, I believe, in the uh, journal Curious uh, and just published uh, within the last week or two. Now, we're going to move on to another study that also was looking at uh, cannabis use, in this case, in people with ADHD, uh, and particularly uh, those who might have been receiving uh, opioid therapy uh, as well, that is treatment for opioid abuse. So here is a study that involved hundreds of patients. Uh, this was done over in Norway. Uh, and it is showing a significant relationship between the extent of cannabis use and the degree of ADHD symptoms with regard to memory impairment and inattention. So there's a correlation here. There's a risk. Uh, the more people use cannabis, the greater were the problems they reported with symptoms and vice versa. The more ADHD symptoms, the greater they were likely to be using cannabis. Uh, so again, it's a correlational study. It doesn't necessarily show causation between cannabis use and deterioration uh, in memory and attention and ADHD. But that last review that I just talked about did show such a causal relationship. So just another study among many showing this relationship of ADHD to cannabis use. Finally, uh, there was a nice review of the literature published in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry uh, that shows that treating ADHD with ADHD medications does reduce offending, criminal offending behavior uh, in people with ADHD. Why is that important? Because we've known for decades and based on earlier reviews that having ADHD does increase the likelihood that uh, a child or adolescent will engage in offending behavior uh, as well as in adults with ADHD. And it appears to be through increased impulsivity, uh, increased use of substances, both of which seem to increase the risk for later offending behavior. Also in children and teens, if there are substance users in the family, if there's antisocial people in the family, those factors increase risk of 
uh, antisocial behavior later on. And then, of course, uh, we also know that the extent to which parents are monitoring children and teens uh, is a factor in whether or not those teens go on to show increased offending behavior, usually because they're affiliating with other deviant antisocial and offending peers. Uh, so we've known about this relationship of ADHD to offending. That's not a new finding in this paper. What is, I think, relatively new here is demonstrated in a population-wide sample of more than 5,600 people uh, that those who were taking medication went on to demonstrate reduced offending behavior, particularly with regard to violent offenses and public order related charges such as disturbing the peace. This review didn't seem to, excuse me, this study didn't seem to show that medications for ADHD were reducing offending behavior related to drugs, to driving, or to sexual offenses or properly related offenses. But I can tell you that other very large population studies in Scandinavia, in Brazil, did show that medication treatment did reduce all of these offending categories, not just the two that were found here. So again, a very nice large study uh, that came out of Norway that showed that ADHD medications can be beneficial for reducing certain kinds of criminality. Um, so that's our research for this week. Uh, I hope that you found it informative and that you'll subscribe to this channel uh, and that you'll tune in next week for another research review. Thanks everyone and be well.